Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously we looked at pretty much everything that involves calling shader compilation functions from the level editor. However, we are also able to send the compiled shader bytecode to the engine to be used for rendering. This is the part that I didn't explain in the last video, so we'll start today's video with looking at how this is done. As we saw before, we have two methods for uploading and unloading compiled shaders. Both are rather simple and just call static methods of the uploaded shader group class. Let's have a look at this class, which is a private class within shader group. It has three members, which are the content ID, combined hashes byte array, and a reference count. The content ID is the ID that's returned to us when we upload the shader group to the engine. Combined hashes is just a concatenation of shader hash codes within the group. Since the same shader can be used by multiple materials, we have a reference count which is incremented every time a shader is used by a material and decremented when a material is no longer used. This way we can upload the shader only once and remove it when the ref count is zero. We have two static dictionaries to aid with this bookkeeping. The first one uses the combined hashes as a key. I wasn't sure if a byte array could be used for this, so I convert them to a string which can be used as a key. The second dictionary has the content ID of the uploaded shader as its key. Next, we have a static method for uploading a shader group. As a disclaimer, everything I am showing in this and following episodes is not thoroughly tested, since obviously we don't have the final implementation yet, and I'm too lazy to write explicit tests for this. So either this will turn out to be some impeccable code flown out from a perfect mind, or we're gonna have to do a lot of bug fixing later, which is more likely since my mind is everything but perfect. As we saw in the last video, a shader group has a list of hash arrays, one for each shader in the group. We use this link extension method to flatten the list into a single byte array. Then if we have a shader group with the same content ID in our dictionary, and it also has the same combined hash array, that means that the shaders are identical and we simply increased the ref count. If the hashes are not equal, we'll unload the old shader group. This might seem strange at first, because why would a shader group that has already been uploaded have a different hash array? But remember that the shader code in the shader group can be edited and recompiled at any time, which could result in a different hash code, and that's why the old shader group should be unloaded and the new shader will be uploaded in the following section. If a shader group has a valid content ID that couldn't be found in the dictionary, then obviously something is wrong with our code and we need to notify the engine developer using an assertion. It's also possible that a completely new shader compiles to an identical bytecode, which will therefore have an identical hash array. In that case, we also don't upload the shader, but use one that's already uploaded. If the shader is new or was recompiled resulting in a different bytecode, then we have to create a new instance of uploaded shader group, send the shader over to the engine and add the result to the shader dictionaries. I probably need to add some comments here to explain the code and I might do that in the next episode. Removing a shader group is relatively simple. If we find the shader in our dictionary, which we should, then we decrement its ref count. When the ref count becomes zero, then we know that the shader group is no longer in use and we can unload it from the engine and remove it from both dictionaries. That's all there is to upload a shader group. Note that it has a private constructor, which means that it can only be instantiated in the upload method. We can test shader compilation by introducing a default material asset in the default assets class, where we also have the BRDF lookup texture that is used for image-based lighting and a cube mesh as the default geometry. Here I added a new method for generating the material. Obviously, we haven't implemented material assets yet, but we can already do the shader compilation part, since materials consist of shaders and optionally textures. I also moved these lines up here, because we want to always set these properties at startup, and not only when the assets are created. 
The rest of the code is new, so we can look at it in defaultassets.cs. Here we have a private method that creates a shader group instance as the input to shader compilation. In create default material method, I'm basically just repeating the same thing as we did in renderitem.cpp in order to compile our shaders before creating the materials. So this is pretty much a translation of the C++ code to C Sharp. Here we have the compilation constants for vertex shader variations, and we use the vertex format as the key to select the correct shader during rendering. Pixel shaders don't use any variations yet, so we leave those empty. I did update the elements type enumeration to match the one we have in the engine. We had this enumeration like this before, and now it uses the same names as in C++. So far, elements type was only used in the geometry editor, which I had to update as well in order to use the new enumeration. Going back to default assets, here we are loading the HLSO file that contains the shaders. This is just a copy of the test shader that we have been using in the engine test project. I did clean it up a little bit and I'll show you the code in a minute. After reading the content of the HLSL file, we call compile shader group method here with the shader type, code, entry function, compiler options, and keys. This will process the data and send it down the pipeline for compilation. It will return a shader group object, which contains the shader bytecode if compilation was successful, or the error messages if it failed. I also added some commented code that indicates how the shaders are going to be used in a material asset. Of course we don't have material assets yet, but this kind of outlines how I'm thinking of implementing it. Now let's have a look at the shader code. I copied this file from the engine test project to the resources folder in Primal Editor and deleted the conditional compilation for lighting and pixel shader. So the pixel shader doesn't support textured materials right now. I might change that later, or I may add another material for physically based rendering, but I'll keep it simple for now. Here I'm showing the whole file, so you can pause and make the changes to your copy. Also, don't forget to include the file as a resource. You can do this in the properties panel, which can be opened by right-clicking the file. Or as you can see here, you can also directly add it in the project file. I'm not sure if this part does anything, so I'll probably delete it later. Before copying the shader file, I made some small changes to it, like here is a bit of code formatting, and down here I added the F0 variable, which is the same as the specular color. I did this to be more in line with the mathematical notation of PBR. So this is basically everything I did in order to do shader compilation in the editor. However, because we moved these files to the engine DLL project, I had to include those here like this. It ain't pretty, but this is the test project, and as I have often mentioned, it's allowed to be messy. And since we don't have access to the low-level renderer anymore, I had to comment out the code for testing the low-level renderer. We also have to change a few things in renderitem.cpp. First, we have to include the shader compilation header like this. And then, since it doesn't have the shader type enumeration anymore, we use the one defined in renderer.h. Therefore, we need to use the graphics namespace. By the way, we need to install the DXC NuGet here as well in order to use the latest shader compiler interfaces. And since we are using the NuGet package, we don't have to run the script that downloads the shader compiler anymore. So I removed the pre-build event for both debug and release builds. Here we see that these two files are removed from the project, and this block is added when we install the DXC NuGet package. And that's all for this episode of the Game Engine programming series. Now if we did everything correctly, we have enough functionality to compile any shader code that we might write or generate in the editor. In fact, we can already check if the default shaders are being compiled successfully just by running the editor. Here we can see that four shaders have been compiled. The first three are vertex shaders and the last one is the pixel shader. We can also set a breakpoint after shader compilation and inspect the data that's returned to the editor. 
For the vertex shader, we see that there are indeed three entries in each list, and we can even display the assembly code for each one. And we can do the same for the pixel shader. Also note that there are no error messages. Again, we have the assembly code here as well. In the next episode, we are going to introduce materials and look at how they can be constructed in the editor and uploaded to the engine. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.